Okay, so this is, again, an introduction to psychological self-care. So in prior sessions, we were discussing the uh, self-care of our biology, our physical self-care. Remember, exercise, sleep, nutrition, medication, doctors, dentists, uh, all that good stuff. Promoting relapse prevention by taking care of our bodies. In the bio, psycho, social, spiritual continuum, we next move to psychology. So bio, psycho, social, spiritual, that requires, and there is an intersection between the physical and the, and the psychological. A lot of that is neurology and a lot of that is brain science. But when we talk about psychology for the purposes of our program, we won't be neurologically inclined. We are going to look at psychology as being um, uh, of or pertaining to the workings of the mind. Uh, the mind does include the brain, but the mind is a colloquial uh, or non-scientific term for our psychology. So a view, assessment, learning, describing, examining how our mind works is how we look at psychology. And for the, state, for the purposes of this program, our, our psychology is going to be viewed as our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, which includes personality. Uh, our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, how we act, how we behave, our history of behavior, how we are likely to behave in the future, and a mindful view of how we're behaving in the moment, and then how thoughts and feelings are created and how they impact our behavior and vice versa. So it's an intersectional, holistic, synergistic view of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and what that creates is our so-called self in our environment. Our environment being our home, our workplace, uh, prison or jail, if that's where you hang out or have hung out or will hang out, um, the streets if you're homeless, and then of course your town, city, town, village, city, county, state, nation, and then planet Earth. So there's a lot going on there. We will be discussing how our psychology today was informed by our psychology in utero, as an infant, as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, and then up the developmental stage. Remember we talked about Erickson's developmental stages of psychosocial development. We talked about Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, all of that creates our psychology as well because those experiences shape who we are today. We also get to look at what modern psychology, in other words, the, hum the average human's psychology in 2022, what does that look like compared to the psychology of a human being 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 5,000 years ago, or half a million years ago? there is a term called evolutionary psychology. And what that really means is our human psychology has evolved. It doesn't necessarily mean evolution as in Darwin, uh, uh, natural selection, Darwin's theory of natural selection and biological evolution. Uh, it does have some of those elements, but I'm not saying that you need to believe in evolution in order to understand evolutionary psychology, you can reconcile evolutionary psychology with creationism very easily. God created original man, and how has that changed mankind, original mankind, whenever that was, theologically? How were those early folks, Adam and Eve types, you know, Old Testament types, how is their psychology, how did their minds operate differently than today? We were having a discussion about what does the ideal human being what does their psychology look like in the year 2022? And a clever uh, group member said, well, uh, the, uh, the workings of the mind of, of, the, of any given human being on planet Earth in 2022 would conform to social and cultural norms and value systems depending on where they live. So the psychology of, of a hunter-gatherer in the Amazon rainforest in 2022 versus the psychology of a Western European or uh, could be vastly different, but it would still fit in 
certain norms and value systems and, and it would check certain boxes. And then of course, even in U the United States, you would say that the psychology of an urban ghetto dweller would be different from the psychology of a suburban CEO living in a leafy suburb. Fair enough. So psychology is impacted by cultural and social interactions and norms and influences. Uh, it is an interesting question though, because one imagines that 500,000 years ago when the prototype or, or whatever that time period would be where the prototype humans or the early humans, which in terms of DNA or, or the eye test are identical to us, uh, the difference would be what? Language and culture and technology. So one could argue that those prototype humans were much more uniformly psychologically functioning than we are today. So the question is, is are we more like our ancestors than we are like the ideal human being that we are supposed to be psychologically in the year 2022? We're more like the human being we are psychologically in the year 2022 than we are our ancestors. Um, well, it, it, there are arguments on both sides. Uh, w one imagines that in order to conform with the, with the psychological ideals of 2022, you would need to have certain conditions in place, you would need to have certain goals and objectives, and then you would work towards them. Uh, evolutionary psychology scientists would say much of our inherited psychology is instinctual or vestigial, which means we're just born with it. So some would say, well, we're much more like human beings from 500,000 years ago because all of those human beings, for example, had a handful of goals. They all did. I need to stay safe. I need to get something to eat. I need to have some kids. I need to avoid death. And I need to live as long as possible. We have those same goals, but we have a lot more goals and objectives that are thrown at us, such as technology, such as not breaking laws, there were no governments back then, so there were no laws. You know, there were customs within the tribe, of course, but they were seemed pretty much basic compared to the vast number of laws and, and, and rules and regulations that we deal with in 2022. So a lot of people say in the postmodern experience, life is much more hectic and complicated, paying taxes, uh, being on probation, having CPS in your life, uh, dealing with anxiety, mental health issues and drug addiction, for example. Um, my personal theory is I really doubt that anxiety as we know it was as prevalent back then as it is now because life seemed to be a lot more simple back then. Anxiety was probably a lot less prevalent in the Midwest in 1920 than it is now, just before the Great Depression in, in the year 2022. So lots of interesting conversations about what our psychology really looks like and a lot of it has to do with what we call narrative and story. We, are, we get stories about how our ancestors lived and behaved, and that's called anthropology and archaeology and evolutionary psychology. And then we also get a lot of stories about how we're supposed to think and feel in the year 2022. I mean, if I were to go around the room and say, hey, um, how, do you, how do you think and feel any, uh, any given day, uh, and do you think that is correct, so to speak, according to the values and customs of your, of your culture, right? So if you grew up in Appalachia, Virginia, say you were born in 1990 and you're, and you're alive now, how are you supposed to think and feel judging by what other people appear to be thinking and feeling and how you were taught to think and feel by what school and religion and television and movies it starts to get real complicated, doesn't it? I really do think that our ancestors lived in a much simpler time and it was probably easier to think and feel uh, in the year 300,000 BC than it is in the year 2022. I'm not sure anyone told them how to think and feel, or less, less, less humans and, less, and certainly the less institutions told them how to think and feel or suggested how to think and feel. Raise your hand if you were told how to think or feel as a kid and you just know it. My guess is that the Flintstones said, listen, here's what you got to do. You got to avoid the saber-toothed tiger. You got to help us find some food. You got to help us, you know, you tell an eight-year-old, you got to help us take care of your baby sister. 
um, and we got to uh, keep moving to find food. That's different than being told uh, you got to care about what you dress, uh, how you dress. You got to be cared. Uh, you got to care about what brand sneakers you wear. You got to care about the acne that's coming out on your face, because that's embarrassing and shameful. The point of this story, and they're all stories. The point of this story is our psychology, the way our minds work, are vastly influenced by a whole lot. Of factors. What are those factors? What factors influence our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors? You hear well, everything. At, well, I, I hear everything. I hear peers. So, so we have socialization, peers. Uh, the gentleman in, in the group said peers, which means uh, our friends, associates, people in our yeah, peer, like people in our like peer group. Uh, we have a lot of social narrative. Other people, institutions like school and government. Um, uh, we also have uh, biological influence, our neurology. So in other words, you think and feel differently when you're five than when you're 10 or 15 or 20 or 25. For the average normal human being under favorable circumstances, um, your brain fully neurologically develops at age 25. So you're, you are thinking and feeling and behaving differently and predictably as you age. So there's a lot of biology there. There's also a lot of genetics. There are there are there is a genetic predisposition to resiliency and temperament and all of these different psychological terms for our personality. Uh, so when you add the nature and the nurture, you start to see a human psychology develop. Uh, and then when you add things like trauma and especially early drug and alcohol use, you start to really see impact on psychology, which means the way that our mind works. So the next couple of weeks are very important because we're gonna start talking about how our minds work. And if you've ever heard the saying, oh, you gotta change your mind, and then you realize how hard it is to change your mind. For example, what's your favorite color? Do you think you could ever change your mind and have a different favorite color? Do you think it would be easy? Or do you think your mind is programmed to be like, you know what, it's purple. If you decided that green was, would you maybe second guess that always? Yeah. If you bought purple accessories and then all of a sudden you just like, oh, you know, green's really cool. When next time you buy something green, might your mind say, well, it really should be purple because that's really my yeah. favorite color. So changing, changing your mind seems to be really difficult. Because think about it, changing your mind means you change your thoughts, you change the way you feel or you respond to feelings. We're going to talk a lot about that. Because a lot of people think, oh, I shouldn't feel this way. Well, you're feeling that way for a moment, but how much is that feeling, the amplitude and the frequency of, say, uh, fear or, or sadness, how much is that impacting your behavior and your belief systems? So everyone says, oh, yeah, I could change my mind. And then when it comes down to it, it's much more difficult. Why do you think rehab is so challenging? For example, your mind has been, for everyone who was in group, your mind has been programmed or it's learned the behavior of what? Using, Using drugs and alcohol to do what? To feel better. To, to make to, life better. To feel, to feel better, to cope, yeah. to deal with stress, mm -hmm. to deal with psychology uh, or, or biology, like chronic pain. Uh, and they're all inter they all intersect. So you've become programmed or it's a learned behavior to use drugs and alcohol when you are stressed. That's your mind. That's how your mind works. How hard is it to change your mind in that context? Uh, near it like seems damn near impossible. Um, of course, we know it isn't, but it's certainly challenging. Uh, so it's very important that we learn how to change our mind when it comes to personalities. You know, so-called personality disorders. You have a crude you have built, you have layers of belief systems and responses and reactions and emotional dysregulation and, and personality traits uh, that have grown up since maybe you were in utero, certainly since you were a child. And by the time you hit 30, how hard is it to change your personality? Seems very challenging. In order to change your personality, you have to change your mind, the way that your mind works. That's what we are here to do when we are discussing psychological self-care. It is literally learning how to change your mind from something as simple as, you know what, I'm gonna open my mind to different types of music. 
hip hop might still be my favorite, but now I'm listening to country Western from the 1960s. And now I'm listening to, oh, by the way, you want to see how psychology works? World music. If any music that's not from the United States is considered world music. So the Western, the, the, the American, the Americocentric version of music is if it's not born in America, it's world music. Well, go to Nigeria and tell them, oh, I love world music. And they'll be like, what are you talking about? This is the music we've been playing for 10,000 years. That's our psychology in a nutshell. In essence, our psychology, and we're going to have really interesting conversations about how it's not just us, mental health, personality, trauma, and drug and alcohol addiction people. The psychology of the human race is to have an inward focus, oftentimes cultural, but an inward uh, either cultural or egocentric focus about our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are designed to do what? Protect ourselves. Isn't that ironic that you could develop self-harm, mm -hmm. such as cutting or shooting dope or drinking alcohol, uh, as a, as a uh, self-preservation -preser behavior ultimately, and yet it's not. It's obviously self-destructive. So our psychology can easily be distorted to, to, to view self-harm, for example, as actually being safe. And that harkens back to part of our discussion of what addiction really is. In many ways, it is a maladaptive, and actually, in the most important way, it's a maladaptive behavioral psychological process whereby you seek self-harm because it feels safe. That's really why we need to change our minds. I don't care what color is your favorite color any given month or year or whether that never changes, but we have to change the way our mind works when we are confronted with stress and distressful situations. So to wrap it all up, our psychology is a very complicated, multifactorial dynamic of stress response. This is going to be a fun part of the curriculum. Uh, I really want you all to use your minds to wrap themselves around themselves. We've got to wrap our minds around our minds. And in order to do that, we have to do what? Be willing to challenge a lot of our beliefs and opinions. We need to open our minds. In order to open our minds, we need to open our minds. So there's a great paradox for you. I want, and I really want folks to start embracing paradox, which is, Supposed contradiction, but in reality, paradox is reality. And that's a paradox. And we'll keep going and going and going. And soon you will hopefully just embrace paradox as being part of life. Okay, great. Good job. And we're looking forward to this part of the curriculum.